So in that transition, now you come coming fresh off a championship. It's time to transition to the NBA. And I know, like you know, the NBA is something that every kid, every player, if you played the game, you've all dreamed about playing there, right? But it's some things that people mm-hmm. don't get a chance to talk about, and that's the mental health. And wow. once you got to Cleveland sure. and you was there, how was your mental health? Because I know, you know, in the passing of your mother, you know, you had a lot of things take place. Mm-hmm. What? How was your mental mm-hmm. health then? And then what advice um, could you give to young players about their mental health that are in the NBA that don't know how to tell other people about it? You have to talk. That's the biggest right. thing for me. Like, uh, like the way I am, I will shield a lot of things and not talk about it unless someone asks me. Like, someone wants to know. Like, I, like I will talk about it. You know, I do get emotional about it because I seen something the other day, and 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 this guy said, "Pain is temporary. My pain is not temporary. My pain is for life." Right. Because there's things that. I endure it in my life and, and things that I've said in my life that I can't take back. You know, so just with argument with my mom and I wake up the next morning and she's gone. Mm. And I haven't talked to her in weeks. My best friend calls me and said, hey man, I haven't talked to your mom. And I'm like, no. And he's like, well, she's been sick for the last two weeks. She's been, you know, sick bed. I'll call her. And we had we had family. He's in Milwaukee. We had film. And Mike Brown, he looked at me. He was like, is everything okay? And I was like, no. And I just started crying. And she told me on the phone, she was like, do you love me? My own mother asked me that. Right. And, you know, and that, it hurt me because I made her feel like I didn't love her anymore just because of the, the pain that she was going through. I was the selfish one of not caring and opening up and making sure that she was okay and not understanding the medication was was affecting her her body and her mind and and i just told her like i would never replace you and the next day we go home and she called me and she asked for uh some money to come see me and i was like all right i seen some money then she called back and was like oh you know what i'm not gonna drive i'm gonna fly and i said okay that's cool and, and then later on that day, she texts me and just like, oh, I can't wait to see my grandbaby and, and make sure you take care of your brother and sister. And I called her because I thought it was weird. Like, why are you saying that? Right, like, you right. About? She's just like, oh, I'm just waiting to see my, you know, my grandbaby. I'm like, all right, cool. And we get off the phone and the next morning, uh, Monty Sherry, she calls me and was like, she's screaming in the phone. And like, oh, why is my sister dead? And, and I hung up the phone, and then I called my uncle, then I heard my uncle in the background, he was like, hold on, Darnell. And I hear the cops saying, well, we're gonna treat this as a homicide. So I fly home right away. Wow. With, uh, I fly home right away, and I get there, and, you know, everybody's outside, and I go in the house, and I close the door behind me, and I go straight to her room. And, you know, the room is a mess, and, you know, I see all my plaques and pictures she had me on the wall. And, you know, I just made up her bed. Like, I made up her bed and and the pills that she took, you know, some of them fell. And I picked them up and I laid them on a nightstand. And, you know, and I just, I fell to my knees and I, you know, I just prayed. Because honestly, I, I truly believe, like, you know, she committed suicide because of me. And, and my, my little brother, he thought it was because of him, because the money that I sent my mom, she had him go get the pills. Uh, Came back here with the pills. And uh, she's like, if anything happens to me, make sure you take my purse. So she wrote us all letters. To this day, I, I, I haven't read mine. Um, they, she left it on a pillow with my name on it. And I wouldn't know how I will. I would react if I did read it because, right. you know, it was tough 
they, and, you know, and after that, man, I was just the speed of light. It wasn't no stopping me. Like I had my my blinders on, and and if I had, if I could put myself in danger, I put myself in danger. It just, and it was just the mental health wasn't there because I didn't know how to cope without my mom. And, that's and all you know, I knew. That's all you knew. And and being an athlete, sometimes we're taught this facade, you know, to put on, mm -hmm. and and to not let right. people see you be vulnerable. And, you know, every day, you know, you learn someone's story or you learn about things that are going on. And I think this is this is this is very tough, first of all, because I love you so much. But second of all, is because there's someone out there that needs to hear this story because they need the same type of help that you needed then, because that right there could it really could change the outlook of where you could have been and what you were doing at the time because dealing with that being in the nba was this your rookie year yeah it was uh my mom yeah my second year yeah so yeah, think about it. it let's 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 you know put yourself at in that at 21 22 years old mm -hmm. you know you just now get into the the position that you've been working for your whole life and something mm -hmm. so you know such impact such enormous a mother right mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. when i look back and me you've had plenty of conversations about the impact of that and mm -hmm. it was some people there for you in your corner i remember we Man. talked about uh in milwaukee practicing with uh coach griff yeah shout out to adrian Gir griffin yes, he was there for you. Griffin, what, tell, tell, uh, tell, tell us a little man. bit about because most people won't know because Griff is right now. Griff is mm -hmm. an associate head coach for the Toronto Raptors, and um, mm -hmm. he was there for you. And you told me that story. Do you mind sharing a little bit of it? Man. Yeah, of course, man. Coach Griffin and Coach BP. When the season was over in Milwaukee, you know, I was by myself, and they made me stay. They knew, like, I, I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was just the way I was acting or if I was always down. They knew, Coach Griffin was like, man, I think you should stay at the season's over. I'm like, man, I'm going home. You know, he's like, no, nah, right. you should stay. So I stayed. I was probably there by myself working out with Coach Griffin and Coach BP for like two and a half, three months, getting ready for summer league. So they made a deal with me. They were like, if you come in every day from Monday, to Thursday, we'll give you Friday, Saturday, Sunday off. And I'm like, okay, cool. And there were days where I was just, like, I didn't have it. And, you know, right. and, and having them to, you know, basically hold me, keep me together, talk to me, you know, they really showed that they cared about my mental and especially my physical, what I was going through. And, I didn't, I didn't know what to do, Coach Jay. Like, I, you right, know, right. at that age, I'm by myself. I didn't have my mom to lean on. I had my grandma to lean on. And they were there for me every day. Even if I was uh, two, three minutes late, they'd call my phone. <laughs> DJ, where you at? I'm like, I'm on my way. I'm pulling up. I'm like, all right, come on. Let's get to work. So that was, that was basically my rehab. That was my therapy. Right. Them running me through the work and talking to me while I'm going through the work, basically mentoring me and preparing me for what's to come. Then uh, before all that happened, I remember we flew back to Cleveland and the first person that walked up to me and gave me a hug was LeBron. And I know wow. how close he is with his mom. And that meant a lot to me. He was working out and as soon as he seen me, he just stopped. I met him at half court and he just gave me a hug, man. And I really need, I really needed that because I love Cleveland to death. I loved all those guys, and all those guys looked out for me. Every last one of them, down to the coaches, man. And you gotta have that. You gotta have people around that really care because there, you know, yeah. there are some people out there that only care about themselves that are selfish. But there's somebody that might need that advice, that might right. need that hug. 
because all it takes is a text or a phone call or an email to say, what's up, brother? I was just thinking about you. How you doing? You don't even got to yeah. text me back. I just want to make sure that you're okay. Right. You know, some people that, forget something. about that. It goes they a They forget way. about it. Bro, you've been in my life over a decade, and I'm always like, how you doing? Where you at? And if I got to come get your ass out of bed, I'm coming to get you out of bed because I care, you know.